you can't see this terrifying and unexplained phenomenon people are experiencing. For centuries, accounts have surfaced of victims abruptly colliding with impossible transparent barriers. Attempts to break through only leave them in circles. They're trapped in a paranormal dimension beyond saving. We're going to unmask an unseen force trapping people in inescapable cages forged from the very air we breathe. In today's episode, we'll sift through folklore, first-hand accounts, and esoteric documents to unravel the chilling reality behind this terrifying mystery and the forces that defy reality to conceal its prisoners. You won't want to miss this one. On a sunny Saturday afternoon in 1995, a young boy experienced something he never forgot. Even though he was only around four or five years of age, the entire affair was so strange that he made a mental note to remember every detail so that he could describe it more accurately when he was older. The boy, whom we'll refer to as Mo, said that everything about that day was absolutely typical, at least until it happened. In fact, he later described the day as quite peaceful. Dad was outside mowing the lawn, mom was doing housework, and had just fired up the vacuum to clean up the hallway. Mo and his sister were inside, passing the time by drawing various Nintendo characters at the kitchen table. As he colored in one of the drawings, Mo said that the tip of his colored pencil snapped off. Instead of choosing a different color, he got down from the kitchen table, headed into the playroom where they kept an electric pencil sharpener plugged in. And within moments, Mo was standing at the desk in the other room, his pencil shoved inside the sharpener. The machine whizzed away, whittling at the tip, and when everything felt smooth enough, Mo pulled out the colored pencil, gave it a quick look, and then turned. And that was when it happened, folks. Mo would say this, I casually turn around to return to the kitchen, and suddenly, I can't move forward. I immediately fling up my hands and I'm pushing up against this invisible barrier. There's no texture. It was like I was a mime in a box. I didn't hit the barrier repeatedly or move my hands all around. I simply kept pushing forward, not budging and calling out for my sister over and over. As soon as her head appeared in the doorway, there was a release and I fell forward. I remember seriously panicking. We sat on the bed and my sister says I just kept going. I was stuck. I was stuck. My parents were oblivious to the incident. It's worth bearing in mind that, as mentioned, Mo claims to have made a conscious decision to preserve this memory. To make his story even more credible, he says that his sister, who was eight or nine at the time, old enough to remember, recalls this incident as well. Even though she didn't experience the invisible wall, she distinctly noted her brother's reaction to being trapped by the very air itself. Now, Mo is only one of hundreds of people who, over the years, claim to have made contact with an invisible force that refuses to budge no matter how hard they try. Whatever these represent is anyone's guess, but everyone who encounters them tells the same story. They find themselves trapped by what seems to be an invisible wall absent just moments before and nothing they can do allows them around, over or under this barrier, quickly causing them to panic. And sometimes these victims can contact individuals on the other side, as in Mo's case. Other times they seem to slip into an alternate reality from which there is no escape until suddenly the sensation vanishes and they are free to move once more. It's a terrifying phenomenon because it seems to show little rhyme or reason. It can happen outdoors, in the lonesome wilderness, or on the street where you live. It can even happen, as Mo found out, in your very home. Now, what would you do in a situation like that, from which there is no escape? While there don't seem to be a lot of good techniques for removing yourself from this frightening scenario, the first thing to remember is don't panic. And the best way not to panic is to understand what is happening to you and that it has happened to a lot of other people before you. After all, as they say, knowing is half the battle. 
So dust off that stud finder and slip on your white mime gloves because today we're on a hunt for invisible walls. Now accounts like Moe's may not get a lot of attention in paranormal circles, but they are shockingly common and have been for years actually, likely centuries. In fact, in 1975, for example, a Mrs. Dillis Cant found repeated attempts to back her car into a parking space were met with resistance from something neither she nor her passengers could see. Either that or she was a terrible parker. Miss Dillis Cant described the sensation like she was repeatedly backing into a curb even though the parking spot was completely empty. Now, it might be easy to laugh at this and assume that Dillis Cant was a terrible driver, but her daughter also noticed this when she got out and tried to walk into the space, only to run into what she described as an invisible force field. Now, another pair of motorists eager to take the space also tried to park, but were unable to do so, well, even when they got out and pushed. Now, by the time officials arrived on the scene to investigate, of course, the invisible wall was gone. There is also a humorous May 1st, 1907 case from Paris where an elderly renter was detained on accusations that she had gone completely mad. The woman claimed that an invisible barrier just over the threshold of her apartment had forced her to shuffle inside on her hands and knees. The magistrate who arrested the renter dispatched an officer to fetch the woman's son. Instead of collecting his demented mother, the man confessed to experiencing the same thing. He even told the court, I do not pretend to explain it. I only know that when my mother, my uncle, and myself enter the flat, we are immediately impelled to walk on our hands. The magistrate refused to believe it and summoned the uncle. He too confirmed the sensation. Finally, officials called upon the concierge of the building in a frustrated attempt to dispel such madness, but the concierge didn't prove very helpful. Even he admitted, all you have heard is true. I thought my tenants had gone mad, but as soon as I entered the room occupied by them, I found myself on all fours endeavoring to throw my feet in the air. Now, at a loss and feeling the need to do something, the magistrate ordered that the rooms be disinfected. So, what the heck is going on here? What are these intangible forces that people are encountering, and where are they coming from? Today, we might borrow from the realm of science fiction to try and describe these invisible barriers. But if you look for similar stories online, you'll see them referred to as glitches in the matrix or as force fields, the product of secret human or extraterrestrial technology. In our past, however, we drew upon analogies rooted in fantasy. In fact, our ancestors once believed that invisible walls represented not some technological marvel, but rather magic. Seers, conjurers, and witches were often attributed the ability to stop people and livestock dead in their tracks through occultic spells. Other times, whenever they encountered these bizarre barriers, our ancestors ascribed them supernatural origins from things like gods, goddesses, demons, and other spirits. In the Old Testament, for example, the Lord forbade Balaam from taking a certain path with his donkey. Balaam tried to anyway, but each time the animal veered away, eventually the donkey flopped down on the ground and told Balaam itself why it refused to move any further. It had seen the angel of the Lord who was blocking its path. Unfortunately, there was no word on whether or not it sounded like Eddie Murphy. Similar stories of invisible barriers also appear in Eastern traditions. In Japan, there exist stories of a type of yokai or supernatural being known as the Nurokabi. It basically means plaster wall. These entities were said to be present whenever someone encountered an invisible barrier in the wilderness. Now, this transparent wall could not be climbed, nor could it be walked around. The wall simply continued on forever. Also called simply the wall or Mr. Wall, encounters with the Nurokabi not only prevented travelers from moving forward, 
but also left them confused and disoriented regarding their own surroundings. In fact, their only hope, according to some traditions, was to knock on the bottom left portion of the invisible barrier with a stick and hope that the wall would dissipate. Now, the idea of running into these transparent force fields while moving around outside is actually quite common. I mean, even today. One experiencer's story would sound very much like the Nurokabi tale if it had happened in ancient Japan rather than more recently, like 2007. The person was around 15 years old when they had their own experience. They were walking to school one day and had reached the part of their journey where they broke off from a small dirt road to walk across an empty field. They did this every single day that they went to school, only on this occasion, it was any different. The experiencer said this. This field was completely empty except for a single tree around halfway along the dirt road. That day I was going to be late, so I ran to school, not very fast, mind you, just at a, at least I'm making an effort, kind of speed, when suddenly I hit something with my forehead and fell down on my butt. It felt as though I ran into a wall that was floating at the height of my head. Confused, I looked around and saw nothing. I stretched out my hands to see if I could feel anything. I felt around at air for a minute or two, but nothing. And then finally, somewhat perplexed, continued on my way to school. When I got home that day, my mom asked about the red spot on my forehead. I told her I ran into a wall, and that was that. Nothing like that has ever happened again, but I cannot forget this experience. To this day, every once in a while, I have to think about this event, but I just can't make any sense of it. Stories of invisible walls and other magical barriers were also once quite common in places where the local populace extensively believed in beings like fairies. In places like County Mayo, Ireland, certain spots were held to be enchanted. Sometimes these locations were called the Stray Sod or the Lone Sod. The tales from these spots sound nearly identical to modern accounts involving invisible walls. Some of the most famous and most disturbing examples come from the 1959 book, The Middle Kingdom, The Fairy World of Ireland by Dermot McManus. Dermot was a military man and served in World War I, where he was seriously injured in the Gallipoli campaign. In his later years, he became deeply interested in the folklore of his homeland. The Middle Kingdom features an entire chapter on the Stray Sod and includes two stories fully authenticated he claimed that involved first-hand accounts of what it is like to be trapped inside a prison made of magical walls. The first of these tales features the rector of a local parish in Leitrim County, whom Dermot identified as Reverend Harris. Now, Reverend Harris enjoyed a reputation any man of the cloth would aspire to, practical, kind-hearted, and enthusiastic about his faith. He was the last person anyone would expect to indulge in silly fantasies regarding the fairies, which makes his tale all the more compelling. Now, according to what Reverend Harris told McDermott McCannis, the year was 1916 on Midsummer's Day, June 21st. He was notified that one of his parishioners had fallen ill and requested a visitation. Although the man's home sat seven miles down the road from the rectory, Reverend Harris knew the way there well. In fact, he was familiar with a shortcut, a footpath that would cut the journey down to only three miles. To make it even more appealing, the trip was a pleasant one. Detouring over the hills, this combined with the fair summer weather and the clear, crisp evening made the decision to take the footpath an easy one. Reverend Harris set off on his parishioner's home around 10 o'clock at night, assuring his wife as he left that he would return no later than just after midnight. But we know how this goes, folks. This might sound like an awfully late departure time, but at this season in the northern part of Ireland, it was actually just around sunset. Dermot McManus described what happened next. At one place, about three quarters of a mile from the rectory, 
the bridle path crosses a seven-acre field in the middle of which stands a large thorn tree, ancient and weather-beaten and locally reputed to be adopted by the fairy folk. The path leads into this field by a strong five-barred wooden gate, full-sized and well capable of admitting a farm horse and cart. At the other side, it leaves the field by a stile, a series of steps for keeping out livestock but admitting pedestrians. The field is surrounded by a bank surmounted by a thick and impenetrable thorn hedge, inside which there is a deep ditch. Notice the description of this field with the large tree it sounds a lot like the story of the schoolboy from 2007, doesn't it? Reverend Harris reached the gate and passed through, making sure to secure it behind him. He set off in the direction where the style should be. Yet when he reached the spot, it was nowhere to be found. Not only that, but the path itself seemed to have vanished as well. Cursing his wits, believing he had either been forgotful or distracted, Reverend Harris traced the length of the hedgerow, searching for the right direction. Yet, no matter how hard he looked in the fading light of the late sunset, he could not see anything familiar. There was no path and certainly no set of stairs that he recognized as the style. Around this time, Reverend Harris began to suspect that something strange was afoot. To his credit, he resisted the urge to panic and instead, he patiently continued to pace the length of this impenetrable hedge, searching for a gap that might allow his safe passage. It all came to nothing, and Reverend Harris was forced to retrace his own steps. He meandered back to the gate and stopped dead in his tracks. To his utter astonishment, the gate was no longer where he remembered it despite having just passed through it moments before. Instead, the lost preacher now found himself in the middle of the field, dominated by the old gnarled fairy tree. It was the only feature in an otherwise empty meadow. Frustrated but not defeated, and fully recognizing the absurdity of his situation, he returned to the hedge, scouring every foot of its length for some sign of the path that he had traveled so many times before, yet the opening never presented itself. Like the endless wall that the Nurokabi manifests in Japan, the hedgerow neither ended nor offered a clear way through. Finally, paradoxically, Reverend Harris wound up back where he began. He was trapped. Dermot McGannis would write this. It is difficult to say how long this impasse continued, but probably it was for a couple of hours, during which time Mr. Harris unceasingly kept up his search for an exit. Suddenly, the spell was lifted. The unseen bars were raised, and Mr. Harris found both gate and style again where they should have been all the time. Indeed, he found himself standing quite close to the style. The joke was over, the fairies had had their fun, and now he was free to continue on his way. However, Reverend Harris now felt it unwise to use the path. Instead of continuing towards his parishioner's home, he returned to the rectory, hopped up on his bicycle, and took off by the most traveled route. Concluding the pastor's story, Dermot observed, seven miles by road, the Reverend decided, was perhaps shorter than any distance through the fairy fields. Now, Reverend Harris seems to have fallen victim to the stray sod. Elsewhere in this part of the world, it might have been said that he had been pixie-led or pook-ledden. It always features a consistent set of attributes, familiar surroundings, suddenly rendered wholly unfamiliar either because the landscape itself has changed or you have somehow been deceived into taking the wrong path. However, the source was almost always the same. A spell had been cast upon either yourself or the land you were traveling, likely enchanted by the fairy folk. The similarities to the modern phenomena, like the mysterious missing 411 disappearances, well, they speak for themselves. We might even see a variation on the stray sod and invisible walls in the UFO phenomenon. Alien abductees sometimes find themselves traveling down lonesome roads for no apparent reason other than they feel compelled to do so by some unseen force. In many of these accounts, their car comes to a dead stop. 
Despite being in fine working order, it completely stalls as if it has hit an invisible barrier. Now, given the similarities between fairies and UFO occupants, it should come as no surprise that invisible walls are common in stories from experiencers of both phenomena. There are many fairy encounters that feature a horse or ox unable to move forward, no matter how much its owner whips it and begs for it to press onward. This was often blamed on fairy enchantment. Now, in some instances, people who were trapped by the stray sod or misled by the fairies explicitly mention the sudden sensation of invisible walls, around which no escape route can be charted. This is precisely what happened in the second story that Dermot McGannis shared. Now, according to the tale, Dermot's own aunt still resided on family lands in County Mayo. However, by 1935, her condition required her to employ someone to help both as a nurse and as a housekeeper. Dermot's aunt hired a 19-year-old girl by the initials of BM. For our purposes, let's just call her Bridget. Bridget's own family lived only three or four miles up the road, and she had seen little of the outside world. Dermot's aunt kept it that way protecting the young girl as she assisted around the McManus estate. Dermot would write this. One Saturday, after her first six or seven weeks at the big house, having the afternoon off, Bridget decided to spend it with the Solons, the housekeeper's family. As it was a bright, sunny day and she was feeling rather homesick, she thought she would first climb Lissard, the famous fairy fort which was less than a quarter of a mile behind the house and not much out of her road. She was to be back in the house by seven o'clock, in time for the evening meal and long before darkness would set in. But at seven o'clock, she had not returned, and when at eight o'clock there was still no sign of her, a messenger was dispatched to the farm. He soon returned with the alarming news that she had never been there, and it did not take much longer to get the same replies from all the other cottages in the neighborhood. At this point, the community began to panic. Darkness had fully fallen, and several search parties were organized to search for Bridget by lantern light. The effort continued until the parties, empty-handed, began trickling back to their homes between 11 and midnight. It was helpless. There was no sign of the girl anywhere. However, they had abandoned hope a little too early, it seems. No sooner had the last search party returned than Bridget herself stormed into Dermot's aunt's house, where she promptly collapsed on the couch and began to <laughs> sob. Everyone present gathered around her, taking in her bedraggled, exhausted appearance. Now, it took a while to coax her out of this state, but after being warmed by the fire and consuming a hot cup of strong tea, Bridget finally was able to share the story of what had happened to her up by the old fairy fort. As expected, Bridget had indeed summited the hill with the crumbling ruin, passing over the surrounding moat and stepping into the grove of trees at the first summit. Now at first, she noticed nothing amiss. The beauty of the day was so fine that the sunlight managed to filter effortlessly through the leaves to reach her atop the hill. She took in all the surrounding scenery, the few square miles she had never left her entire life. Now suddenly, something was wrong. The atmosphere around her turned darker, an unseasonal chill seized her, as if the early summer had skipped fall entirely and invited the cold winter winds to envelop her. It was a bit too sinister for her taste, so Bridget took a few quick steps towards the fairy fort's exit, and it was there that her evening of terror began. Now, Dermot McManus described what Bridget said happened next. It started really small. I would just get really tired or feel like I was being watched. I would get scared for no reason, and my husband, who's a very calm guy, would get furious over everything. I started not being able to sleep near the closet in our room, which connected to the bathroom, which was connected to the laundry room, and had to have my back pressed against my husband's, and even then, I could not sleep a lot. At first, the girl just brushed off the sensation, much in the same way that Reverend Harris did. 
she herself was to blame, likely not paying attention, and Bridget set off for the same exit, only to have the exact same thing happened. There was a bizarre internal jerk and she was turned around towards the heart of the ferry fort. Now, following a brief moment of astonishment, Bridget began fighting off full-blown panic. She looked beyond the border of the trees, out onto the landscape, whose serene, sunny appearance directly conflicted with what she was experiencing. She held her gaze on that scene, hoping it would give her the courage to find her way out of the ferry fort. It was not meant to be. She reached the bank of the ditch, encircling the fort below, and received the fright of her life. Dermot wrote this. About 15 minutes in, the lights in the living room started flickering. Five minutes later, they went out. I figured it was a faulty surge or light, but I refused to go and check because it was in the laundry room, and I stopped going in there before we even started moving. Next was the kitchen lights. These were right next to the laundry room, flickering, then off. I wanted to leave right then. The feeling of serenity that Bridget experienced when first summoning Liss Ard had completely vanished by this point. The girl began to detect a presence along the northwestern edge of the ferry fort, dark and malevolent, that sought to keep her confined to its invisible prison. Whatever it was, she had no desire to confront it head on. Instead, she continued to pace the side of the hill nearest to her in the hope that a gap in the invisible wall might present itself. Now, eventually, the hours stretched on, the sun began to set, bathing the landscape in the dull orange of twilight. Yet still, she continued to search for an exit, pacing like an animal in the zoo. And each time she tried to leave, her escape was inevitably halted by the invisible barrier separating her from the outside world. Eventually, Bridget began to notice something far down the slopes of the hill. The rescue parties had begun their search by whatever hope Bridget felt quickly vanished. Dermot McManus's description of what Bridget experienced is absolutely chilling. To the modern paranormal aficionado, it sounds all too familiar. He would write this. This next part he told me about, and I believe him. When he went to shut the door, he heard the attic door open and slam shut. He quickly slammed the door closed, but felt something pulling the door open. He saw the face of a woman with the body of a snake and in his head felt the deepest hatred he has ever felt. Whatever it was wanted him dead. He used the last of his strength to shut the door, turn the lock, slam the screen door, and almost flew into the driver's seat, started the car, and refused to talk to me until we were almost home, which is about 15 miles away. I swear, he just ignored the speed limit, which, by the way, he never does. It's why I love being in the car with him, and his face was white as a sheet of printer paper. I never went back to the apartment, and to this day, I suffer from anxiety over what had happened. Bridget was forced to endure this feeling of helplessness as she watched another pair of parties scouring the landscape below her, clearly close enough to hear and see her, but... For some reason, perhaps the invisible wall separating them, completely unable to notice her presence. The girl watched as the final search party appeared in the distance, the pendulums of their lanterns swaying and fro through the darkness, and a sinking feeling arose in her stomach when she realized that they were too far away to hear her. Even if they were closer, she was still trapped in this transparent cage. Now, no sooner had the girl sought this than she came to an encouraging realization. The oppressive feeling that she had battled for hours had left. One final time, she probed the edges of the ferry fort, only to find that the invisible barrier walling her in had now miraculously vanished. She scrambled away from the top of the hill as quickly as she was able yet remained stealthy as she followed the final search party back to the McManus estate. Bridget remained fearful that the intangible imprisoner that held her captive all day might spring a new trap at any moment. 
Indeed, the few calls she made to the lanterns up ahead elicited no reaction. The zone of silence still seemed to envelop her, so she would just keep quiet and continued pushing forwards until she stormed through the gates of the big house. In closing Bridget's story, as wild as it may sound, Dermot McManus emphasized her authenticity. He would write this. No reasonable person listening to her could doubt her story, and though she was closely questioned, she never deviated once even in detail, nor has she ever done so since. No house had received her that day, for such a possibility was checked up again and again. There could be no doubt at all about her physical exhaustion, which was inevitable after standing such long hours and in such distress. That her frock was quite clean, unstained, and increased was further evidence that she had not slept or rested anywhere. In a very interesting development, some aspects of Bridget's story bear a resemblance to other, more recent accounts. Recall the chill that she felt around the same time that her invisible prison sprung up. This sounds a lot like what one person experienced in their own home back in 2008. The person said that they were turning off all the lights in the house as they got ready for bed. After taking the house cat into their arms, they turned off the final light, leaving only the bedroom well lit. It was a straight shot from the living room to the bedroom with no obstacles in between. They later shared what happened next, saying this. As I was passing my couch with my cat in my arms, I bounced off of something that wasn't there, like literally. Imagine someone walking directly into a wall, but the wall is invisible, even stranger. The moment I collided with whatever it was, I got a rushing wave of heat all through my body starting from my toes to my head, and then immediately, an ice cold chill from the top of my head all the way down to my toes. My cat reacted with a long, stressed sounding meow, indicating he sensed something was off too. Notably, this was the only time that this experience occurred in the home. The person also swears that they were not using any mind-altering substances and they were not exceptionally tired at this time. The implication that Bridget had somehow entered another reality can also be found in another account from late 2023. The Reddit user Wretched Crook shared a story in which their surroundings seemed noticeably odd, followed by the presence of colliding with an invisible force. They wrote this. This was a few years ago, during a weird period of my life. I was walking home alone late at night, maybe 1 or 2 a.m., and the night was incredibly still and quiet. I live in a populated area that constantly sees traffic and pedestrians, but on this night, absolutely nothing was moving, and it was eerily quiet for a part of town that isn't remote at all. It's long boulevard from which you can see parts of other big streets and side streets, but there were no people or vehicles or animals, nothing. The trees and grass were also still, so what happened couldn't have been a random surge of wind or something similar. I don't normally jump to paranormal stuff, although I am not opposed to it, but this was really damn weird. Also, I was completely sober and I never take drugs. Anyway, as I was getting close to my apartment building, something straight up hit me and forcefully pushed into the bottom left part of my back and left my entire left half of the body numb for a few seconds. I was bewildered and looked around like a maniac, thinking maybe it was a bird or a bat or something, but it wasn't. There was just nothing. And even if it was an animal, why would it ram into me and cause my left half of the body to go numb? When taken in conjunction with Dermot McManus's accounts of the stray sod and centuries of traditions surrounding invisible barriers, a terrifying picture emerges. It seems as though there are indeed invisible forces all around us which have the capacity to fashion invisible cages for us all with very little effort, trapping us within a reality parallel to our own from which we have no chances of saving ourselves. The only way to escape is when they let you free. As disturbing as this possibility sounds and as chilling as the accounts can be, 
consider something else. We only hear about those who do escape. So that makes me question how many others don't. And because you guys have made it this far into the episode, I want you to all comment down below. This video drove me up the walls. So I know who made it to the end of the video and who didn't. And if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll see you guys in the very next episode.